you know, I could talk forever. Um, but why don't we stop and uh, take some questions from you, uh, and uh, we'll go from there. So, for the future of American literature in schools, do you see African American literature converging with sort of the general American literature, or do you think it's going to remain sort of a more sectional part of the You know, it might depend on where you are in terms of the states and in terms of departments. When I got to the University of Central Arkansas, there was no African American studies uh, literature at all. So I introduced it, and I introduced it as a minor, then they became a major. So we now have the only African American studies major in the state. Um, mm -hmm. Amir Baraka, who helped us teach the first class in the University of Wisconsin, at one time, uh, because uh, Addison Gale had said, um, African American literature written, literature written by African Americans, about African Americans, and from African Americans. And we both felt, though, that definition was too narrow. But Baraka was very, very political then, and he was pushing it. Uh, years later, I asked him, I said, So, how do you feel about African American literature now? He said, I'll tell you what, the person who should teach it is the person who's willing to do the work. And by that, he meant those people who are willing to go to the conferences to do the research in the libraries, to have students do the research about the literature. Uh, and it should be done there based upon that and not color. Uh, I, I say that because in my college, the two best professors in the African course are white men, one from the University of uh, North Carolina Chapel Hill, uh, and one from Princeton. Uh, and uh, students love them. Why? Because they, they go where they're supposed to with the students. Uh, people don't know, for example, that years ago, the MLA, the Martin Language Association, which is the premier organization for uh, English uh, professions, split. And the CLA, the College Language Association, split away from that, and that's primarily uh, African American writers, scholars, and so forth. Uh, and so um, that, and that they split simply because there was not enough being written about that in the uh, African American literature uh, in the major, you know, literary journals. And so, um, at my university now, obviously, uh, it was in the English department. And then I went to the history department because they did a, did a better job. Plus, they had African scholars that had African and African American literature. Uh, I'm going on too much to say that I think that it, <clears throat> it still is going to take a, a very difficult time for it to be in the canon as a, a, a alongside other literature appropriately. It took my department and other departments four years before they would even put Tony Martin in the canon. Uh, and that's so that gives you an idea in terms of how difficult it is. Another thing Maurice you <coughs> you talked the other day about taking the names of works so that people would go down the straight track based on the colour or the racial origin of the people to make them focus on the work itself. Now if you did that, what sort of themes would you come, see coming out of black American literature? Typically Well, you know, the, one of the problems we had in terms of setting up curriculum at the University of Wisconsin the fact that we really didn't want to, we didn't, uh, we had problems with the name African American, uh, African American literature. Because we felt that once we put that on it, it's, it's going to stick, and that's, that's what it's going to be. It's never going to be a American literature. Mm -hmm. You know, and so it's, um, I had a big debate about that. And, you know, I mean, people came down, scholars came from everywhere, and we talked about it. And uh, um, the reason why, I mean, let me back into your question. The reason why people were so fervent about starting African American Studies program, uh, in some respect, had less to do with the canon than it did with getting control of the image of blacks in literature. Because blacks had been portrayed so stereotypically in all the literature, particularly that given by Harvard. And there were five major stereotypes. One was the carefree primitive, the type of one that you see in Don't Look Men, that one would like. 
The other one was a devoted Christian slave who has heavy to stoves on the palm. The other was the tragic mulatto. Uh, the mulatto is that you see an imitation of life and pinky. Uh, I, don't, I know these movies, you don't know, but these are movies that talk about it. And uh, a mulatto, as written by the white writer, was not uh, a black person. It was a white person who had the misfortune of having black blood. Uh, and in your state of Louisiana, there were more laws that had to do with skin color. And you can imagine. I mean, if you, you know there's a mulatto, there's an octoroon, and there's a portrait. It sounds like animals, you know, some kind of. And uh, that's one half, one quarter, and one one fourth, one half, one eighth, and what whatever it is. Yes. Um, uh, uh, an octoroon could own property. A fourth room could vote. All right. A mulatto could be the mistress of a white man. All right. I mean, so that's. I mean, so there were laws associated with skin color. All right. The fourth one uh, was the, the, I mean, was the buffoon. And that was your sambo, your step and fetch it in the movies, if you've ever seen the movies. And the fifth one was, was the one that was done by D.W. Griffith in Birth of a Nation, and that's the Black Beast. Mm. All right. And so, and the Black Beast is someone whose primary aim is just to, to rape and kill white women. You know, and so those were images that had come that had been by white men and women writing about blacks. If you think about it, Uncle Thomas Cabin played on Broadway for 30 years. A uh, black man didn't play that role uh, until the last two or three years, a man by the name of Sam Lucas. White men had played that role with black face, black men faces. And Sam Lucas even had to blacken his face in order to you know, conform to the stereotypes. So, the reason for the literature was to try to get control of the stereotype. And that was panicking when we were discussing it. Because they said, if I, in order to get rid of the stereotype, I gotta write the stereotype. And if I write the stereotype, am I really destroying it or am I promoting it? So in Native Son by Richard Wright, you've got Bigger Thomas, right? Who is the beast. But what he what uh, Wright does for him, in the, he realizes that, okay, fine, if I'm a beast, I'm a beast. You know, being angry, being chilly, you know, is a good thing because it gives me an identity. And so what Wright does is he takes that black beast and he turns it on society. He's saying he's not responsible for himself, you're responsible for him. Um, but it's a very, very, you know, thin line and a difficult path to take in if you're going to do that. Uh, and finally, Alan Locke, Alan Locke said in the New Negro in 1927, look, if I write something about blacks and folks like it, fine. If they don't, I don't care. You know, uh, if, the, if, if there's a sense in terms of, if it helps people understand themselves, fine. If, they, if they're not, I don't care. And they have to take a position that they have to write for the integrity of the literature and not for the politics of the literature. And that's tough because at that time all literature was politics. It was all politics, you know. And so it's it's really really tough. It's really tough. So, um, um, the whole thing about skin color is is very fascinating to us, uh, and they were preoccupied with it in the twenties and thirties. You had blacks who owned uh, restaurants and cabarets that only whites could go to. You have blacks that owned them that only fair skinned Negroes could go to. I mean, you know, uh, look at the movies of blacks, look at the movies of blacks in the 20s and 30s, give me a break. All the, you know, it's the Lena Horns that grew out there dancing, all right? You know, I mean, you know, it's, it's, no, it's, no, it's no deal. Right. One time my mother went to school, was I was in a play, and they, were, they took photographs of all of us in the play and they sent them home. Um, I'm going to look at the photograph and see where going. And I said, Mom, where are you going? <laughs> where are you going, Mom? So folks would tell you, know, when she had that look on her face, uh, and what happened is that the woman had made the photograph and all the very fast young Negroes were in the front, or in, in, in the middle, and all the girls came on the end. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> this is another great school, right? 
by a black teacher, right? <laughs> I'm told, I'm going to walk into the room, take a picture, straight to the She said, you plan on doing this again, right? You plan on making another picture, right? Uh, and she did. Uh, and I said, well, what do you plan on doing? And she said, well, I'm going to do But um, that was, you know, that was the life that I lived in. That's life I've lived in, so forth. Um, one final thing on that. There's a place, has anyone ever heard of a husky in North Carolina? Mm. Hmm? Yeah. You know, you know about a husky? You know about a husky? Mm. Maybe not. A husky in North Carolina is a place where most of the blacks there look like her. Oh, the hair's Yes, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, they, and, and so it's, uh, and we, until you understand that about the black society, that is every race. First time I went to my aunt in, in Oklahoma City, I went to see her, and this, you know, blonde head woman comes to us, oh, mommy, how you know? I said, who in the world is that? She's my aunt. Um, um, and so, you grew up in that kind of environment in which, uh, for blacks, the concept of race, particularly from skin color, is a joke. It's a real joke. It had nothing to do with skin color. Nothing. How could it when you, when you got every color in, 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 the, in the race? Um, so I'm trying to get to your question now. And the answer is, I, I think you, the problem is that in order for it to be out there, you have to label it. You know, I mean, that, that's, the, that's, the, and that's, the, that's the, the thing we live with. You know, you have to label it. Tony Morrison is probably the only one who gets universally labeled. You know, she's an African American and she's also in this literature. <coughs> what about people like Dina Simone and uh, J.C. Morgan creating novels? Well, you know, classical music is, I mean, it, it accepts everybody. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I mean, it does now. I mean, you know, Christine Price and Jesse Norman and so forth. I mean, they can sing anything in opera. But there was a time when Marilyn Anderson didn't sing in opera. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, and so, it, you know, it, it changes. Uh, but it's, um, and I can tell you still, people will go to that opera looking at her as a black singer. Uh, you know, as opposed to being just an opera singer. And that's the reality of it. More questions or comments? We've got about 15 minutes. We'll have to wrap this up by 7. And then have about 20 minutes of mingling with food and drinks. And then the writers will all have to assemble at the lobby downstairs at 7.30, so a bit of time now. Mm -hmm. Good. 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 Thank you for sharing your personal story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you certainly love the powerful an inner motivation for expressing yourself in emotion. What it you from the start? I, I, listening to, to your presentation, I learned a lot about the history of the academic side. Mm -hmm. You were personally involved in front lines with it and your personal story. And I, and I thought about all the writers, and I thought of African American writers, certain names come to mind, Richard Wright, mm -hmm. uh, Ralph Ellis, and the more recent generations. But well, in terms of the short story itself as a form, if you do have some writers you think of as kind of pure short story writers like Alice Munro or people like that, um, who, who are some of the names that you would cite in terms of the African American short story? Well, you know, I, it's, um, I, I love Gene Tuma, you know, in terms of Kane, I mean, I think that when that book came out, sort of, you know, discovered that it was just, you know, um, it was mind boggling to all the uh, scholars. And I still like to read that book um, uh, in years in terms of um, Alice Walker, Gloria um, uh, Hurston, Langston Hughes in terms of his books. Uh, uh, I always sort of go back to the old folks. <laughs> start with them. You kind of have to start with them, you know. I mean, it's sort of like um, my master thesis on Halton and Melville Twain. You know, I mean, it's, it's just, um, and I love them, and I still probably, uh, you know, people like Henry James are some of my favorite writers. Um, I always feel as though if a student like Henry James, I got an English major. Uh, and so, um, uh, Disney Packer, you know, recently is, is a really good writer and so forth. 
been trying to find somebody with the comfort I can't. Um, uh, 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 Don Hagen Wiseman, I mean, he's been in my area, but I haven't, I haven't talked to him much, and I haven't read him as much as I like, and so forth, um, uh, in terms of, you know, modern minds. Um, uh, and actually, I like, I, I like my Angelou better than I do uh, Tony Martin. I know people will, will kill me for saying that, but I do, you know. Um, um, uh, and I think that it's, um, uh, you know, the problem is that uh, you go on the web now and you make up black shorts go to write it, you get 15 pages mm -hmm. of single space, you know, and I, I, I haven't read all of them, I wish I had, <laughs> you know. Uh, and so it's, um, um, God, it's, it's tough. Uh, I don't even call them so early, but you know, I mean, the, the stuff that you get from Bruno um, Hurston and so forth, I mean, it's just really, I, I love her life. I just love it, you know, because it's almost oral in tradition, in addition to being, you know, um, and she, she sees so well around her, you know, you know, and for her sometimes it's almost what she doesn't say, what she doesn't show, what she doesn't her. And so it's, um, I guess the problem for me is that I just couldn't understand how anybody could read them out, you know. You, you think if you're going to read literature, if you're going to show uh, students good literature, show them good literature and spread it out, you know, and this, they can learn. They can learn from making new babies, they really can't. <laughs> you know, they really can't learn from W.B. Du Bois, you know. Uh, it's, um, and uh, we, we create disciples in our class, and they go into the high schools and the audience on one of these just little children. And it, they still fight the battles in that included. And so it's, it's um, um, I will say this, and, and that is, there was some skepticism even among blacks uh, in the 70s about the short story form. And, yeah, and the reason is because the novel is such an 800 pound gorilla, you know, and so you, if the only way you're going to get him a can of this is to write a, to write a novel, white writers wouldn't get into this with the short story form. So why would I want to do that? Right. At the same time, it, it was, it's so in sync with American lifestyle. It really is, and, and values and so forth. So, um, I, I appreciate your comments also. One thing I forgot to tell you, and if uh, my mother were alive, she'd be a very clear if I didn't tell you. And that is my grandmother was an Indian, chop Indian. Mm -hmm. um, and she was born in 1868 and she died in 1971. Mm -hmm. And she had six brothers and sisters, all who lived to be over 100 years old, so I hope you pass those genes on down. <laughs> <laughs> but, Nana was really one, and I know not my mother, but my mother got her spunk for her. Nana, um, um, once she realized that they were going to put Indians on the reservation, you must understand Oklahoma has more Indians than any other state, even in Mexico, so people don't realize that, but they do. When they realized they were going to put uh, Indians on the reservation, she kicked out her Indian husband, married a black man, he took her hair and put it on her head and put a bandana on it and passed her black. <laughs> you know, and my mother was the first child of that relationship. <laughs> and, um, the others were Native American. I mean, you know, and she didn't like being called Native American. That term came slowly for the end of her life. She said, I'm Indian. I, I wasn't Native American. My mother didn't like to be called black, Negro. She didn't like to be called colored either. But you could call her Negro, but you do not call her black. You do not call her African American. She said, no, not that I'm a Negro. Like being called color, and um, you know, so it's you know, I've gone through color, Negro, black, African American, and whatever the next configuration will be. You know. um, so it's, um, but, um, and I say that because that's a part of my heritage that I didn't know anything about. It. Obviously, I don't do not look Native American, you know. So what my grandfather, you know, her husband stamped me well, uh, but. Um, uh, and my grandfather on my father's side was what they call black treat. And so, um, because it's, uh, Oklahoma had this miscegenation law, which means that you cannot intermarry up until 1970. 
uh, this was dope because all the Native Americans buried within, within the blacks. <laughs> you know? uh, and so you've got incredible mixture. You know, um, uh, when the plantation owners came to Oklahoma, it was never a slave state, it was a free state. They brought slaves and traded for horses. So uh, blacks in those Indian communities grew up knowing how to, you know, to hunt and fish and so forth and so on. Um, and I knew black cowboys long before I knew mm -hmm. white cowboys and so forth. You know. So when I went to the movies and saw the white cowboys, I was like, who were they? <laughs> 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 what were they doing in the movies? It's not supposed to be in the movie. You know, but um, that, it's, um, uh, my life was different. But at the same time, it was common for me. It was just, you, know, you know how people say, uh, movie stars say that I thought everybody had a movie star? Well, I thought everybody had mom and dad like mine. You know, I mean, they just were incredible folks. But um, who uh, zealously enjoyed our privacy and so forth. Um, uh, my brother and I were talking, uh, my brother and sister are still alive and we talked about this week. We were talking about three months ago and I realized that none of us were allowed to play with our cousins. And we're talking about that 25, 30 cousins all over the place. We were never allowed to stay with them. We were never allowed to stay in their house. We were not allowed to play with them. And we've been trying to figure out why. And we finally figured out why. How can they stay in your Christian children? Mm -hmm. And there was no way to run. Mom was going to let us be in that house or remain a beautiful children. No way. Not even close. No way. And that's, that's what we realized. She was not going to put us in that house. I mean, it's right. So it was, um, and that was, was very bizarre. Because, you know, you, <laughs> they would come and say, Mommy's well, coming over. And Mom said, No, you can't go. You know, I could go to the Auburns, go to the Thompson, I could go to the Grays, I could go to the Ingrams, I couldn't go to the Leeds. <laughs> very, very strange. Did you have a question? Yeah, I'm I, I did. Um, I'm sorry, I'm talking too much. No. <laughs> Well, because you, you spoke a lot about the idea of the rhythms and how important uh -huh. rhythm is for, for the uh, short story on. And um, there's an Indian writer I really like who's passed uh, away called Raja Rao, who um, drew a lot, I mean, grew up his entire life sort of exploring Indian philosophy, a Vaita Vedanta philosophy, and read Sanskrit, um, uh -huh. so was able to read the texts um, in the original language. And, uh -huh. As a writer, as an Indian writer who you know did migrate, he brought a lot of that element of the, uh, with the rhythm, even the cadence of the Sanskrit language into his writing. Uh, he was very versatile in many languages, and so a lot of people think really revolutionized the form, the structure, but, but also the rhythm. So I was wondering. Um, Elements of yeah, the influence of music. I mean, the kind of music that you mentioned you growing up with, and how much that would be influencing the rhythm of, of, of writing a short story with you know, Latin American writers. At the same time, dealing with the pressure of what is the canon? You know, mm -hmm. when you're raised to believe it's the canon and the stuff that you have to read, and sort of this is this is what uh, stories written in English must sound like. Mm -hmm. Most of them aren't English. You have a very particular idea of how that language has to sound. But, but there's a rhythm and a cadence that also comes from other languages you speak, or the music that relates to it, mm -hmm. um, and how that seeps into the language. Yeah, and you certainly say the language of the English. You know, so that the reason you say that, 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 that cadence around that. Um, uh, and I think that it's, in particular in terms of his poems, you know, that's a, that's a sense of it. Um, in terms of, um, uh, actually, I think, I think, maybe not as much as my answer, but I think Tony Austin has really been beloved as a certain kind of rhythm there that, um, um, I think, you know, late at night with a glass of wine, you get going, you can feel it a little bit. Um, gosh. I've got your call, I'll send you some names. <laughs> okay. um, because um, um, one of, in one of the classes, um, there is uh, an African American that does a writer from Africa. 
you know, writer and scholar from Africa who teaches the course. So he brings drums to class. Uh, and he has students read and so forth as he plays the drum. And he just, you know, this was this poem or this story was not intended to be drum at all. But he sort of plays it a little bit in the background. It's amazing how it influences how students read and so forth. And so he said, I always read stuff when drums were playing. And, and that's sort of how he, you know, uh, it, it's always right. I used to like when music is playing. Um, and <coughs> you know, it's one of the things about how well I do. Um, there's a certain difference between those other culture and things like that. Um, but, um, uh, uh, you know, a lot of you probably know much about living in poetry as anybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway. Any uh, final comment or question? Yes. My question is just that in your in your opinion, what do you think is the possibility for the need for a label to be superfluous in the future? For the what? Like the need for an identity such as you need to be African American, you need to be Asian American, you need to be Latin American. At what point in time do you think it would be possible for that need to vanish and for that whole mess to be cohesively just known as American literature? Oh, would that like label be there forever? Hmm. Oh, well, that's a good question. <laughs> um, I've got two answers. One is one I get my students when they said, I've, I've never seen stuff appropriate for, you know, gay writers and so forth. You know, all of it is, is, is too stereotypical. And I said, well, the only way you're going to see this is for you to write it. You know, if you feel that way, you're going to have to write it yourself. Uh, and I think that we're going to have to have people who come out of classes like you who get into administrative positions to make that happen. So, you know, it's, um, you know, even at the beginning when I talked about a poem that I gave that had the class, I, I still do that. I mean, I, I still take poems and track out the names. It's amazing sometimes how they think just a woman writing a poem. A man, like, you know, they don't know. They don't know the author's name. So I, I didn't realize how much people are prejudiced, even more by gender than they are by race. Sometimes, in terms of reading literature, sometimes it's a, it's a woman. They just throw it away. Literally, just put it aside. Don't read it. That's a woman. I, I'm serious. Amazing. But when they, if you take that off and they have to read it, uh, then all of a sudden, sudden, you know. Um, they don't have, you take away their shield, their shelter, their comfort zone, you know, um, because now they've got to go to the literature to tell you what it's about, as opposed to bringing something to it, predetermined. Um, that still bothers me a lot. Um, it also bothers me, that I have two mixed feelings about whether or not, regardless of what your race is, you can write whatever you want as opposed to, regardless of what your race is, you can be interpreted by the way that you do. Um, because those are really sort of two different things. Uh, we wanted our blackness and uniqueness to shine forth. There's no doubt about that. But we also wanted to be universal. You know, we're, we're, we're somebody's dog, we're somebody's son, we're somebody's wife, that's what it's about. Uh, but we also have an Italian, a Jewish, an Indian, and so forth culture. That's important. That's why someone, someone asked me, you know, what does it mean to be black? And what are you talking about? Because I said, you breathe in it, you know. How can I be something else? <laughs> <laughs> so what do you want me to be, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I was very upset because I had never heard the question before because it never came up. You know, um, and so it's, but, but yes, I, I think that um, it's going to take the, the Any other questions? Well, one very small thing. Um, uh, keep really getting rid of the stereotypes and then say, hey, we're educated, we're intelligent. But we have our own little part mm -hmm. as well, so we're different. 
And you don't realize that. You don't. That's serious. Well, but the problem is, quite frankly, sometimes it's the educated who are the most prejudiced. I mean, I never thought we'd have a problem with an English department at a little university in one of the most liberal states in the country. The guy on the street was accepting better than the guy in the, in, the, in, the, in the English department. You know, because when you think about it, you take you strip away everything now. You really strip away everything. But if you strip away all those kinds of things, and things then that white professor, the only thing he has left is the fact that he's white. That's all he's got left. And so he's got to do to take that. So keep the, keep the blacks out. Keep the women out. The only thing he has is that he's white. And so you're talking about somebody being naked. Um, so that's, that's, the, that's the problem. So thank you very, very much. Thank you so much, Maurice. I cannot match all the uh, stories and illustrations that you gave, but I, I will cite one. About seven, eight years ago, I had this wonderful privilege of being in Ball State, in Indiana. And there were two of us built to give readings. On one side, you know, it was 4 o'clock in the afternoon, we were supposed to read. So on one side was a reading by Kirk Powell from Singapore, and there was a reading by Tony Morrison. <laughs> and so he had, like, he had like 200 people like, I had like 20 primes <laughs> in, my, in my little room and so I, so I met them and I said you know why don't we all just adjourn and go and see <laughs> yeah, but they wouldn't let me they said oh you know we want you so you know it was okay but over dinner when we were talking and Tony said she said you don't mind me asking because I'm very curious what have you got under that terminal of yours? Anyway, if I may, uh, because this is a very final time we are together in this particular way, could I please call upon all the writers to stand up as I call your names, Maura? You could just stand up, Roger. Thank you.